Okay, we're ready to start. Hello and welcome to what is now our annual risk review and preview event. My name is Lutfi Siddiqui and I will be chairing the panel today. If risk preparedness and resilience is about having a diversity of perspectives, I'm absolutely delighted that we have a distinguished and multi-dimensional panel today, joining us live from New York, London, and Singapore. Some quick housekeeping points. The event is being recorded and we expect to publish the recording on our channels. I believe it's also streaming live on YouTube right now. We'd like this to be as interactive as possible, so please uh, ask questions, use the Q&A function on Zoom, and please don't forget to identify yourself. All right, so let's get started. The title of our session is Risk Landscape Review 2021 and Preview 2022. What has the year 2021 been like in terms of financial and investment risk management? Did we frame and approach risk in the right manner? What has worked and what has not in 2021? What is it that truly surprised us? What are some of the open questions that we're still grappling with? Perhaps things that research and academia can help with. Are we looking for risk in the right places? Or there are new dimensions, new interactions of risk factors that we need to get up to speed on? These are some of the questions that we'd like to explore. And I will invite each one of our seven speakers to make some opening remarks to help set the stall from their respective vantage points. We will go in alphabetical order by their first names and I will introduce them one by one as I call on them to speak. First up is Mr. Bilal Hafiz. Bilal is the founder, CEO and head of research at MacroHive, an independent provider of macro and financial markets research He's of course very well known in the industry as the former head of foreign exchange and rate strategy at Nomura and Deutsche Bank before that, where he was also head of multi-asset research. Bilal, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And your opening remarks, please. Great, thank you, uh, Lutvi. When I look back at this year, I think one of the things that stands out is how positive the year has been in many respects from a financial market perspective. So equity markets have done surprisingly well. Many people didn't think equities would do as well as they have done over the course of this year. Profitability of companies has been very strong. Um, and then on top of that, if you look at the credit cycle, many people were expecting an increase in bankruptcies, defaults and such to impact the credit market. And we really haven't seen that. So in many ways, this year has been very positive uh, in the sense that the fallout from the pandemic wasn't as extreme as many people thought. Now, some of that is to do with the policy response that we had both from a health perspective and fiscal and monetary policy perspective. And some of it is just, you know, the pandemic was such an uncertain event, we didn't really know how to forecast this. Um, perhaps the biggest debate though I found amongst uh, investors and people in the financial markets was the debate around inflation uh, over the course of this year. It's been probably the most heated discussion we've had. And it's, it's difficult to know who's been right on inflation because directionally, everybody was expecting inflation to pick up this year, and it did, but it's, been, uh, it's ended up uh, reaching a level which no one was really expecting. So it was higher than expected. But the uh, impact on markets was the opposite of what people were thinking. Most people were expecting that if inflation in the US, Europe and elsewhere was, you know, four, five, six percent, you would expect bond yields, like 10 year bond yields to be much, much higher. And in fact, they've been really, really very muted. Uh, that's been perhaps the biggest surprise for many people. So in the inflation debate, I'll kind of break it to two parts. One is the path of inflation and the other is the market impact. And the market impact has really been very, very muted. Now, why is that? If you look at what rates markets have been telling you is that the markets have been saying that we get near term inflation, so transitory inflation, but longer term inflation is going to be very low. And that's partly because there's an expectation that central banks will raise rates and partly because there's an expectation that supply chain issues will, will resolve themselves. But there's also this issue you know, further out the curve that because debt levels are so high now, it's very difficult for long-term interest rates to go up too much. And so 
markets are almost saying that we're still on the edge of a recession at any point now. So, you know, we, we could have this burst of growth, burst of inflation, but if central banks were to hike even a small amount, it will tip the economy into a recession. So that's really what the market's been grappling with. And rates markets have been really refined in terms of how they've been pricing heights and easings. It's, it's tried to forecast this perfectly. And a related point is how to think about growth and inflation this year. And a simple way, which I think people, you know, you know, perhaps get a bit too bogged down on supply chain issues. If you step back, you could almost say what we've seen this year is an oil shock. You know, oil prices have almost doubled over the last 12 months. So WTI has gone up almost 100 percent, notwithstanding the, the, the recent sell off that we've seen. And this is similar to what we had during the Gulf War in 1990 and similar to what we saw in the 1970s. And so when you have a, an oil shock, the market typically uh, uh, rates markets, at least typically respond in the way that we've been seeing today in terms of pricing near term inflation and then longer term recessionary issues. And this goes to a larger issue, which is the energy dynamic, which again has been one of the unexpected outcomes of this year, which is that we've realized that we have all sorts of energy shortage issues, whether it's uh, we're not producing enough oil uh, for various reasons, whether there's natural gas issues coming into Europe. Um, and this links us back to the other big sort of debate of our time, which is climate change. Um, and in some ways, what this year tells us is that there's no free lunch with climate change. You know, if, if we are serious about climate change and restricting fossil fuels, that means there will be a higher cost in the short term for somebody and for everybody, perhaps. There's, there's no kind of free lunch here. And it's interesting to see how policymakers respond to higher oil and gas prices. Do they throw in the towel and just release supplies from their strategic reserves to bring down those prices and stop the market from benefiting renewables? Or do they say, Let, let's keep uh, fossil fuel prices high, um, take the pain in the short term, and then have this shift to renewables? So, so these are some of the things I think have been very important. You know, the, the year has been surprisingly positive from a credit cycle perspective, equity market perspective, labor market perspective. Uh, on the inflation side, inflation has been good and bad. It's been uh, bad in the sense that printed numbers have been very high, good that bond yields didn't sell off. And then the third issue, I think, has been this whole climate change debate you know, around how willing are we to have an energy sort shortage in fossil fuels and how serious are we about climate change policies? Thank you so much, Bilal. That's a, that's a wonderful sweep of uh, a range of macro issues. And I'm sure we'll touch on the climate change question. And uh, a question I will have for you later on is around the first point you made, which is that the curve has been quite sophisticated uh, in, uh, without just going for a linear time for rate hike or rate down. But is there, a, is there such a thing as a nonviolent exit from lax monetary policy? Uh, or are we stuck in this um, uh, region for rates uh, forever? So that'll be your question when we come back to you. Next up is uh, uh, Dixit Joshi. Dixit is group treasurer of Deutsche Bank based in London. And amongst his previous roles, he was head of listed derivatives and markets clearing, global head of prime finance, head of equities for Asia Pacific. He currently sits on the board of ISDA and of AFMI. Uh, Dixit, welcome. And thank you for joining us and uh, your opening remarks, please. Sure, Lutfi, and, and thank you for, for having me. You know, I'd say, you know, if you start with the picture of saying, you know, the S&P is at 4,700, at the beginning of the year, if I'd said to you the S&P is 4,700, where do you think 10-year Treasury yields are? You wouldn't be saying they're at 147 or, or thereabouts. And that tells you really about the conundrum that, you know, not, not just we and, and I face as a bank treasurer in managing a balance sheet through a period that's quite unique, but also the challenges that central banks, you know, are equally equally facing. So perhaps I'll, I'll refer to 2021 and then, you know, some views on, on how I see things going forward. You know, in 21, we were expecting the great normalization. You know, we'd been through COVID, tremendous amount of central bank liquidity extension, uh, you know, staved off kind of an extreme crisis, a huge fiscal um, reaction as well at the same time. And, you know, the view was that, you know, this year you'd see normalization, you'd see supply chains start to ease up, um, and you'd start seeing, you know, markets going back to, to kind of the way they are. In fact, what you've seen is, is really the opposite. You know, you've had 
you know, again, with COVID-19, some stop starts through the year. So it hasn't been smooth uh, coming out of last year. You know, inflation has surprised on the upside. Um, you know, you've just seen the German numbers come out this morning, you know, with inflation at 6%. To put that in perspective, that 6%, um, you know, has, has bond yields, nominal bond yields uh, in negative territory uh, right now. And so, you know, of course, you know, you know, that, you know, one, one should be tempered there because bonds only have a 10% free float with much of the, the open stock held by the ECB, as well as held by price incentives of investors like pension funds. But nevertheless, you know, you normally have called that a bubble, you know, 6% inflation, negative rates would normally have said, you know, you, you have referred that to a bubble. I think the problem of liquidity is enormous. And as always, you know, try and try and follow the money. You know, we've had a fiscal uh, impulse of around 25% of GDP or more. You have, and any time when you've had, and I, any time uh, an, an impact as large as that, which I think was in World War II, you saw inflation of somewhere between 8%, 14%, 9%, you know, in those kind of ranges, whenever you've had that kind of fiscal stimulus. But over and above that, you then have, you know, something like 8 trillion of excess liquidity in the system, Whereas, you know, if you think back to the last big lesson we learned during the financial crisis, you know, about a trillion of liquidity was injected into the system and effectively staved up an, an, a, a, an even deeper impact during that period. And then thirdly, over and above those two, you then overlay the fact that you have at least a few trillion of excess savings um, in the system with householders as well, you know, one would think some of that would come to market and get spent eventually as conditions normalize. It doesn't make for a pleasant picture, you know, inflation wise. Um, you know, now what the markets don't tell you is what underlying inflation is actually doing. And, you know, some, somewhat, you know, in jest, you know, if you didn't need to eat and you don't need to fill up your tank and you don't need to heat your house and you didn't need to buy any, you know, Christmas presents with electronics, you're just fine. There's no inflation. Um, and therein lies lies the difficulty. I think that where the markets are trading right now doesn't really tell you about you know on the ground conditions, and therein lies the risk, I think, for 22. Um, you know, it's highly likely that you know central banks will have to play catch up, especially you know with the Fed. It's always very hard to land in the right zone. You know, they're always waiting for data to confirm that infl inflation wasn't transitory and is much more permanent. By which time, of course, you know, we might be in, a, in another zip code inflation wise. And so when I'm thinking about next year, I'm thinking about credit spreads being you know, much wider than we've had this year. Um, for example, it wouldn't be unusual if you looked at historical patterns for credit spreads to, you know, for example, in the high yield space to be 150 to 200 basis points wider. For defaults to start going up, again, we saw you know, some signs of that this year with China and the property sector, but we really haven't seen default rates go up anywhere else. You know, high likelihood that starts changing, you know, during, during next year. And it will be a year characterized by, I think, you know, a fair bit of volatility. And so from my perspective in managing a bank balance sheet, it's, it's about creating nimbleness and some optionality around the timing of your actions. You know, you always want to be able to act when you can, as opposed to when you're forced to, when you need to. And that's driving my thinking into next year. Thank you, Dixit. That's a, that, that's a wonderful perspective. My question, I guess, will be, um, do we have any anchor of valuation anymore with so much liquidity around? Um, is it the everything bubble? And so give me negative yields. I'll still buy because I have nowhere else to put my money. Um, and therefore, you know, is this something that, that is permanent? There's just no way out of it. Uh, I will have a specific question for you about Deutsche Bank, because I saw in the news that you guys got upgraded, uh, which to me is bizarre how that's possible. You're the treasurer. You can tell us. Um, but, uh, you yeah, know, we'll talk about that in a moment, but that'll be my question uh, for you. Um, next Switching gears away from uh, macro investing in this traditional sense, let me now introduce Hugh Van Steenus. Hugh is currently with UBS, previously senior advisor to Mark Carney when Mr. Carney was governor of the Bank of England. And Hugh's report on the future of finance 
is the basis for the Bank of England's climate plan that they announced in June 2019, which included the first climate change stress tests for financial institutions on a TCFD basis. In an earlier life, he was head of banks and financial research, financials research at Morgan Stanley. Uh, Hugh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Climate is somewhat topical, would you say? Uh, well, indeed. I mean, look, thank you for having me today and joining this fun, fantastic Brains Trust. Um, like Bilal and Dixit, I mean, I think about, for, before we go into climate, you know, what are the big debates we've been engaging on this year? So first clearly has to be um, in the central bank impulse and what is the impact and fiscal impulse and what's the impact either on inflation? Is this finally the end of QE infinity? And what does the normalization of the rate environment look like? And I think that remains stubbornly central to everything and, and the repricing of the entire you know, curve and asset classes. I think second has clearly been, uh, what does the economy look like post pandemic? And I think particularly I'm interested in also how supply chains get reorganized, uh, the digitization, have we just simply fast forwarded five years or are, or are there more fundamental changes in the way that firms operate? And I think particularly um, I'm intrigued by the sort of uh, the acceleration into the digital economy. What does that winner takes most mean for industry structure, for antitrust policy and so forth? But for today, uh, we were going to focus on climate risk because that's what you asked me uh, a little bit to, to talk about. And I think that, you know, at one level, it's, it's very easy to say uh, this was the year when the penny dropped about uh, climate risk uh, is, is going to be increasingly not something 15, 20, 25 years out, but something much more within the horizon of the current management teams. And that's both because of the speed of actions, the repricing of the cost of capital for certain assets, the sense that public policy may move, and as Bilal said, I'll come back to, may not move as well, but may move, and therefore there might be some more stranded assets and, and so forth. And also, um, I think a, a big weight on many firms' shoulders that they what's right for society, what's right for their employees, what's right for their shareholders will be a different construct. I'm struck, one of the, the numbers that I've most been most struck by this year, and I probably should, on, a, on a public call, probably won't say the company, but one firm, who um, rebranded themselves as one of the most eco-friendly um, sector economy firms has had a 50-fold increase in job applications since they rebranded. And I think, so we, we shouldn't underestimate, it's not just shareholders and policymakers, it's also one staff. So look, what, what, what does this mean for me? So I think the bottom line for me uh, will be twofold. One is, uh, I share uh, Bilal's view, it's a bumpy road to net zero, and therefore we need to be much more open to a wider range of outcomes not just the ones which either, you know, stay where we are stay, or, you know, the, dream, the eco dream, it's actually the pathway could be very bumpy, very different in different economies, and therefore firms, investors need to think about that bumpy road differently. And then, the, and then for 2022, I think it's going to be, well, I'm going to call it the year of the climate stress test, because I think in many ways, these scenarios will start to raise some, you know, big issues. Um, in terms of context, uh, when I was working with, uh, with, with um, the former governor, um, the Bank of England at that stage was the only firm, a bank in the world to think about um, doing a climate stress test uh, uh, outside of Europe. Um, now there are 38 central banks around the world currently committed to do climate scenario work and with the Fed uh, also saying they're quite intrigued. So I think there's a, a lot of uh, work being done to try and think through what are the scenarios, what's the speed of outcome, uh, what's the impact of repricing the cost of capital. But let me leave you with, I think, what I think are the four big debates. Um, so I think first has to be greenflation. So are we, if we turn off fossil fuel energy faster, what does that mean to um, the price uh, and, quite frankly, not just affordability, but energy security? And I think there are very, very different geopolitical reactions to energy security. And as you can see, you know, with um, uh, you know, the recent actions of the Biden administration alone, you know, of ensuring one's population can afford today uh, always trumps the tomorrow. However, how that gets weighed up in, a, in, a, in, in different political systems will be interesting. I think for investors, one of the biggest challenges is many, um, so 40% of professionally managed assets have now committed towards net zero through the uh, Glasgow initiative. I suspect that'll be over half by the end of this year. Um, but what does that mean for your portfolio? Um, if re inflation really is picking up, um, how do you inflation protect and diversify your portfolio? In the 70s, oil and gas stocks, you know, doubled in real terms uh, when the S&P was down in real terms. 
Uh, again, 2000, 2010, energy stocks were a great source of, of value. But what do we do now? And I think the conundrum we're talking about is this is a year when green has become much more mainstream. And yet here we are in the last 12 months, oil, oil and gas stocks have doubled. Clean energy is up about, what, mid-teens, mid to high teens. So, you know, actually clean energy has not been a good diversifier or inflation production so far. What does that fail, therefore mean? I suspect one hypothesis would be it means that many asset managers will start to make the case for more activism, more engagement, because they really want to hold on to these assets. <laughs> and, and if they don't do the activism and engagement, it's going to be much, the license to do that to be much more difficult. But again, that's going to be interesting, as you're seeing with Shell at the moment, what do these, these um, co corporate engagements mean? So that's one. I think second would be what's the central, the regulatory, the financial regulatory response. So I'm going to leave the public policy to one side for a moment because that, that, therein lies a lot of the detail. But the, but this the financial regulators. Are we going to have just climate stress tests? And it, as long as the firms are thinking about climate risk in their day-to-day -day metrics, then job's done. Or they come back and go, you know what, you're not repricing this externality, therefore I want to have green add-ons, brown add-ons, green haircuts. But is there really any basis for that? Because surely that's the job for governments to think about externalities, not the central bankers. So how green financial regulation plays out, I think is actually very complicated. And I do suspect the ECB has already signaled it wants to put in capital buffers for green. Is that actually a wise idea? Could it be counterproductive, uh, particularly if we really need to fund innovation uh, and the transition? I think a third topic, and this is more in Bilal's camp, is like, will there be a steepening in the cost of finance uh, for carbon intensive issuers? Again, one of the conundrums is, despite the worry about green in the environment, the credit curves for many oil and gas firms are flat as a pancake. I mean, they're, or they're no, they're no steeper than other firms. So on a relative basis, they're in there. But should we expect a steepening? And again, this is one of, I think, as ever, as Dixie put it, there's some, a number of conundrums. If we really care about this, there should be a steepening. But maybe actually management actions, management, management reactions and uh, changes in policy, maybe the market's just pricing in that actually, you know what, the, the world's got 80 percent um, addiction to fossil fuels, maybe actually chipping away at that's going to take so long that actually the cash flows remain stronger for longer. So I think that's going to be a debate into 22 as well. Uh, and then the last one is the politics of green and how does that play into the various markets? So are we going to see uh, that if if, if um, governments don't respond to energy affordability security, then they will start to get penalized. And again, I think there's very different reactions, let's say in Germany, to the UK, to the US, to China. And I think that obviously has a big uh, impact on the markets too. Um, but you know, look, it's, a, it's a complex topic, uh, but I do think that the mainstreaming of climate metrics is going to be uh, very um, important. Can I leave you with one other conundrum? I also think that one topic we've debated before over the last 15 years is, um, Active asset management is in public markets in decline. It's more in, in ascendance in private markets as people try to shift their risk budgets. 2021 was the year actually active asset managers had the best inflows for years. So again, there's another conundrum that cheap money fuels many bull markets around the world. But with that, I'll pass back to you. Thank you, Hugh. Quite a lot to, to unpack there. Um, my question to you will be around, you mentioned stranded assets. And I'm thinking stranded financial assets. What do banks have on their balance sheets right now? Do we know? And is it a systemic risk that we may need to be aware of? Uh, just because we just don't know what's in there. So as disclosures get better and better, uh, what is it that we may uncover? Okay, now we will hear from two members of our home team from the London School of Economics, starting with Cathy. Uh, just before I introduce Dr. Cathy Ewan, I want to remind the audience that um, the Q&A box is open, so please feel free to dump your questions as we go along. You don't have to wait until the end. Dr. Cathy Ewan is Professor of Finance at LSE and co-investigator at the Systemic Risk Center. Prior to her PhD from MIT, she worked briefly in the Emerging Markets Trading Desk at JP Morgan. Uh, she's working remotely for the IMF right now and will need to leave us about at the 45 minute mark. So Cathy, really uh, grateful that you've made time for us. Um, so welcome and your perspective, please. Thank you. Thank you for your kind introduction. And I'm delighted to be a 
uh, speaking on this panel. Um, before I start, I just want to uh, uh, say that um, what I'm um, going to speak today reflects mostly just my personal opinion and now the, um, those um, uh, from the fund. So today I would like to speak about the risk um, posed by the crypto technology um, to the financial industry. Uh, let me just give you some numbers to put the, the risk in context. So, um, um, Launched in 2009, the total capitalization of crypto asset um, has increased uh, from uh, under 1.5 billion in April 2013 to over 2 trillion um, in September this year. And during the COVID-19 pandemic in particular, a trade in crypto asset has accelerated, almost tripling in nine months. And now it's about, actually uh, about the 450 billion. Um, you probably all heard of the term DeFi summer. So it's uh, basically the industry that no longer can be ignored. So today I'm just going to speak four points. And um, one, I want to talk about uh, interconnectedness uh, for this uh, crypto asset sector to the, what we, I can say now, traditional or real <laughs> financial sector, okay? Um, so a few years ago, the risks posed by the crypto asset sector were uh, deemed minuscule, mostly because they're smaller, they're fringe, um, um, considered a fringe asset, now, given the rapid adoption and the wide adoption, um, even Bank of England and start to consider um, they could pose financial stability risk to the whole economy, um, mostly due to its um, extreme volatility, uh, as well as um, the existing financial institutions have direct and indirect exposure to these crypto assets. Um, this is not just conjecture because data has confirmed the um, spillover effect exists. In fact, increased during the pandemic. Um, compared to the pre-pandemic, the correlation of for S&P 500 index uh, with Bitcoin, um, price uh, returns has increased more than fourfold. It's quite a huge number. Um, this is actually is not that the highest increase. If you look closely um, among the correlation of crypto assets with emerging market indices, certain emerging market indices and certain developing market asset classes, this increase is even higher. So we can no longer uh, treat crypto assets as fringe assets. So every financial risk manager should, if he or she has not done so, start to uh, assess um, the exposure of his uh, or her own business to the crypto asset. So this is the first point I wanna make. Um, so the crypto asset indeed start to uh, uh, pose some uh, uh, a real risk to the financial system. Um, I also want to uh, mention three potential uh, challenges that uh, uh, this uh, crypto technology bring to the financial industry. The first thing I want, first challenge I want to mention is, um, um, is the challenge to the traditional payment system. Um, you all probably heard the term stable coins. So technology innovations such as stable coins, uh, which are basically digital tokens even packed to some sort of market reference, um, has provided a new way to conduct payment especially cross-border payment services. 
potentially could disrupt the existing forex market, competing against major currency broker dealers. So we'll see major changes um, um, you know, horizon. Um, the second is, um, is the disruption by the DeFi lending platform to the traditional lending model, even the banking model. Um, DeFi uh, lending pl platforms such as Compound and Avi um, have collateralized lending built in smart contract. So basically, um, circumventing the financial intermediaries in collecting funds and lending to potential uh, uh, investment. And the finally is, um, is the exchange market. So blockchain technology is no longer just a settlement technology. And we see markets are developing on the blockchain and um, certain protocols such as automatic market maker um, makes use simple rules to set the market prices and harvest liquidity. This potentially would render the existing broker dealer redundant. Okay. So these are major changes coming within horizon. Um, uh, uh, our risk manager's horizon and cannot be ignored. Um, I would say like the major risks posed by climate change, the emerging digital finance uh, present another mis major risk to the financial industry. That's basically my... Thank you. Remark. Thank you, Kathy. It's a, it's a sobering thought to take stock of this thing that's developing on the side alongside our traditional finance world. Um, my question to you, and I'll come to you first because I know you'll have to leave. So as soon as I'm done with everyone, you'll, you'll get the first question. Uh, and the question will be this point you made about collateralized lending happening on with smart contracts, uh, which I wasn't aware of. I thought this was more a payment and settlement thing. But if indeed there is credit relationships developing over there, is this a source of systemic risk? that we need to be aware of? And if so, what could be some of the regulatory responses to that? So I'll come to you uh, with that question. Uh, and it also actually ties in very neatly with uh, what um, we'll hear from Neil Pollard. But before that, um, uh, our second academic from LSC, uh, JP, uh, Dr. Jean-Pierre Zegrand. Uh, JP is Associate Professor of Finance and Co-Director of the Systemic Risk Center and co-director of the Financial Markets Group at LEC. He's uh, the director of the MSC Finance Executive Program and amongst many things, member of the Bank of England Macro Prudential Panel, the market subgroup. And JP has just had his booster jab. I hope you're feeling all right. Thank you for joining us. Over to you. Thanks, Ludwig. So I took um, uh, Ludwig's instructions uh, to heart and I pretend to be the president of the risk committee of Bank LSE. Bank LSE stands for Leveraged Supervised Entity, and we pretend to be a commercial European mid-sized bank. And what I wanted to do is look at sort of the surprises and what worked well in regulation, financial regulation, in as far as this mid-sized European bank is concerned. And then if I have time, look into the future and what could upset this lovely bank LSE. So people mentioned already the first obvious thing in 2021 was that governments withdrew their support measures and yet the world didn't come to an end. We did not see uh, bankruptcy spike. Of course, we may have kicked down the can further down the road because governments now have a lot more debt than before. But that's the first sort of thing. And that was not terribly obvious. And there was a lot of debate what would happen if these support measures were withdrawn. And actually, not much happened in most countries. That was a surprise. The second regulatory sort of surprise was that the Fed withdrew many of their facilities, like the primary dealer credit facility, commercial paper funding uh, facility, money market mutual fund liquidity, and all of these things were withdrawn end of March 2021. And there was no funding liquidity uh, problems. The markets remained calm. 
sort of quietly, uh, I think, there, there were some big changes that didn't really change anything, but may uh, change things in the future. And the Fed made two facilities, two repo facilities, standing facilities, which is the SRF, that's the standing repo facility for primary dealers, which they did not have before, and FEMA, uh, their foreign and international monetary authorities repo facility was made standing. These are they were not drawn upon very much and they don't do very much and you can look at the numbers and the numbers are zero in both facilities but for me i think those may be watershed moments where the fed actually sort of um, decided that it committed to being a lender and a market maker of last resort in a much more formal way than before even though nobody draws on them now there will be situations where people will draw on them and together with the widened fx swap lines it feels a little bit to me even though nothing is seen in the market it feels like the bank of england in the gold standard at the end of 19th century beginning 20th century where they finally realized actually they were not just a commercial bank they had bigger responsibilities and they formalized them over time to become the central bank of the world at the time so it feels a little bit like we're witnessing the fed really becoming uh, that uh, that you know worldwide formalized leader and i can maybe later on talk a lot uh, about that the other thing which was interesting is that there's too much liquidity uh, so we went from 2020 to little liquidity to now too much liquidity a lot of reverse repo at the fed and other central banks and the interesting thing there i think is that why are is there so much reverse uh, uh, repo at the Fed. Of course, it's the QE money, but it's deposited by money market mutual funds and not by banks. And then the question is, why do they deposit the money there? And that's because of the leverage ratio. So the leverage ratio will be a topic for years to come. And commercial banks in the US and we are bank LSE, it's the same for us. If we operate in Euroland, I don't want money market mutual funds to deposit huge amounts of money on my book because I will sort of have to you know, pay them zero, but I can, I can get negative rates in return. So there is a disincentive. Banks do not want to have that money directly deposited with them. And, and therefore we see all of that money flowing into the, uh, the central banks. So here's the role of this leverage ratio. And surprisingly, the US actually did what this, they were supposed to be doing. Macroprudential rules were loosened in the crisis in 2020, and they were again strengthened in the US because of the reserves no longer being excluded in the leverage ratio. So sort of surprisingly, the US actually, you know, strengthened macroprudential rules again after crisis, whereas Europe and the UK as, uh, cannot really be said the same. So in some sense, the surprising thing is that macro pro only works if you lose it in crisis and strengthen after the crisis. And the Fed actually did strengthen after the crisis, uh, which is a little bit uh, surprising too. And maybe one or two more points, housing bubbles. So as bank LSE, we operate in the UK and in, on the continent, and we see housing bubbles uh, in, on the continent and maybe in the UK as well, but definitely on, on the European continent. And so just an, as an anecdote, what bank LSE saw that some countries, regulators or, or macro prudential you know, boards actually put limits to loan to value for housing loans. So now some countries have a, a, a limit of one. So loan to value cannot be bigger than one. And you would think that's a good thing, but interestingly, and that's why I mention it, in some countries, the loan to values actually went up after there was a cap on loan to values. Uh, uh, surprisingly, again, because we are under surprising things which happened. And the reason is that once the macro prudential authorities said there's a limit of one, lots of you know, people who want to buy houses didn't know there was a limit of one. And they were always told the bank would never lend them more than 70 or 80%. So now they know, ah, oh, the macro prudential regulators think one is actually safe. And it turns out people went to their banks and say, you only want to give me 75%, but I want one because it's safe to be one because it's written on, on a paper that one is actually safe. And it turns out that the pressure of the borrowers actually increased the risk and the loan to values in some countries because of its unintended consequences. 
of these rules. So that's sort of my surprises as a small and medium bank uh, in the UK and on the continent. And if, if I have the time later on, maybe I would like to talk about a few of the risks for next year. Again, coming from this regulatory sphere, the first one is moral hazard. Moral hazard, I think, is building up in the system. We have seen, based on research we have done at LAC, that the Fed's policies have been very, very effective in reducing the fear, the should uncertainty. We, JP, should we come back for the prognosis for next year? Absolutely, let's do that. So then I stop at this point here. Thank Absolutely. you. But I, I love this uh, leveraged supervised entity concept. I think we need to do a spin-off on that <laughs> and uh, have a separate event to elaborate on that. There's a lot to, to do there. Uh, moving on to um, Neil Pollard. Uh, Mr. Neil Pollard, joining us very early in the morning from New York, has just started with Ernst & Young as a partner in their cyber practice. He was previously the group uh, CISO, a Chief Information Security Officer at UBS, leading their global cyber and information security program. He's also an adjunct professor at Columbia. And he may or may not still be a US intelligence officer focused on counterterrorism. I wouldn't know, but he certainly was that uh, several years ago. Uh, Neil, really, really appreciate you joining us across the time zones. Uh, welcome and your opening thoughts. Uh, thank you. Uh, to clarify two things. First of all, I no longer work for the U.S. government, haven't in over 10 years. Uh, and secondly, as usual, uh, my remarks are those of my own don't reflect any uh, uh, policy position of any of my current or past affiliations. So this is this is just me riffing off the top of my head. But I, I want to talk about um, a slightly different uh, uh, basket of risks, which is the operational risk side. Uh, what, what is the financial uh, services system uh, looking at in terms of operational risks? And the one that I hear most commonly uh, at the top two or three of the risk register in, in uh, any size of a bank, the ones that uh, anything from World Economic Forum to many studies, including LSC, and of course, the regulators are paying a lot of attention to as not only uh, every firm's top operational risk, but a systemic risk to the financial services system is, of course, cyber. And by cyber, what I mean by cyber, it's important to understand cyber as a business risk. It's certainly technology intensive, uh, but when managing it, uh, when reporting it to um, uh, leadership and to the board, um, and when treating it with controls, it needs to be understood as a business risk. So it is uh, all the risks, all the losses and liabilities, uh, market, financial, client, reputation, um, legal, regulatory, uh, that can happen by virtue of conducting business connected to the internet. Um, that is uh, in a nutshell. And I see... Um, I see 2022 as really a continuation in most parts of what we saw in 2021. Now, one thing that hopefully has gotten better um, is the risks that were associated with COVID. Well, COVID in general, hopefully that, you know, that is being a managed risk. But what COVID uh, sparked was a massive workforce working from home, right? So now firms are, um, in some cases, <clears throat> as dependent as average citizen getting their home computers secure as they are uh, with the corporate CISO, you know, and what I used to do, making, uh, making the corporate network secure. And in some cases, uh, uh, the family's uh, computer system at home and their Wi-Fi network isn't as secure as a large bank's uh, uh, cybersecurity. So in many cases, we saw that a, a, a corporation's cybersecurity was in the great part dependent on how how uh, well secured the average employee was working from home since 95% of the workforce was working from home. And that gave them access to client data that gave them access to corporate systems. Um, so what we did see uh, is uh, we, we did see a little bit of that, but we also saw many industries um, really pivoting toward that. What do we have to do not only to extend workability from home, extend the IT from home, but also extend security from home? How can we make sure that, uh, that, um, you know, weaknesses at home don't translate into uh, operational risks for the business. So hopefully that will be a reduced risk um, over 2022. Corporations have gotten much smarter about that. Uh, there are some risks that did improve, what, uh, that did increase uh, with COVID, taking advantage of the situation. One is commonly called business email compromise. Uh, now let me take a step back. Most, when I say cyber risk, most losses that financial firms are looking at is either cyber enabled fraud, financial crime, or, um, or data theft, client, client data theft, which can be monetized, but certainly uh, imposes all sorts of legal and regulatory liabilities, privacy liabilities. 
Um, so that has been and will continue to be very great risks. I'll get to ransomware in a second. That's the one that's made an enormous amount of headlines in 2021. Um, I don't see that going away in 22. Um, but there were also some niche risks that popped up in 21 that I think firms have gotten better at dealing with. One was called business email compromise. Now, this is a good old fashioned con game. This is where someone sends uh, you an email that looks legit, but it's spooked. It was forged by a fraudster, but it looks like someone, either a client or someone in the firm with authority that says, can you please move a million dollars from point A to point B? And it looks real, feels real, may actually have been a stolen email thread that's been turned back against you by a fraudster, but it's not real. And of course, with COVID, uh, a lot of traditional fraud control measures, such as callback, where you call somebody at their desk and say, was this leg is this legitimate? This is part of the authentication and verification. Well, if they're not at their desk because of COVID, um, callback and some other controls have changed. Now that was something we saw it increase, but hopefully that's going down. And certainly the uh, cybersecurity and the fraud departments and the business lines of many firms are getting smarter and smarter about that. And both from a process and technology perspective, there are better ways to deal with that. <clears throat> but the risks that happened that really you know, grabbed headlines in 21, I think will continue into 22. Um, that is of course ransomware, uh, that is data theft. Um, and what we saw is how exposed a lot of companies are to the third party, the supply chain. Right. So when I say supply chain or third party risks, there's really three uh, areas of damage that can happen by virtue of not how you control your own environment, but how you're reliant upon your suppliers and your vendors to control their own. First of all, many suppliers and vendors have sensitive data. They have client data. If that gets stolen, it gets stolen. Whether it gets stolen from your systems or supplier systems, that's still a risk that needs to be managed. Uh, secondly, is are your third parties or your suppliers connected? to your infrastructure? Are they connected to your computers? Can they introduce ransomware or, or any sort of malicious software into your environment? Something very important to manage um, and won't go away. Uh, and then thirdly is really, what's the operational impact if your suppliers get hit with ransomware? One thing that's already been mentioned uh, earlier is how brittle the supply chain is. I think we can all see how brittle the supply chain is. Um, I don't think it's that much different um, for the, the financial services industry than it is for you know, logistics. And if you remember, um, I can't remember what year it was, 2013, 2014, maybe 2015, where NotPetya uh, was a uh, ransomware strain that hit a number of different industries across many different industries, pharma, but also shipping and logistics. Some of the largest shipping firms were locked down for a long period of time, could not move anything because of ransomware. Okay, that was when the supply chain wasn't that brittle. Now imagine something like that happening and a lot of suppliers or even one or two key suppliers not being able to provide the operational expectations that their, that their clients have. Um, with the supply chain as brutal as it is with ransomware happening um, and with third party being generally a risk, I think the operational resilience of a firm also includes uh, calculations on cybersecurity, not just how third parties might lose data, not just about how third parties might introduce badness into our environment, but how reliant upon them, how good are they at keeping their operational uh, 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 cadence up and running for our expectations? Um, so that's that's my prognosis. Um, doesn't sound very cheery. Sorry. Thank you. It's a, it, it's a risk panel, so I, I wasn't expecting that, but thank you so much, Neil, for that uh, perspective. Uh, my question to you will be, it can be actually one of several, but let me leave you with one uh, for now, which is, uh, do you think banks, particularly the very large ones, the, the GSIBs, um, are they, is there techno-determinism in the way they're adopting new technologies uh, to the extent that, that they may just not be on top of all the ways in which things can be compromised and the risks that they may be running? Um, because from the outside, sometimes I feel that, you know, they're taking pride in saying we've cut headcount from all relationship roles and we've got IT people now value us as a platform company. Uh, and then once in a while you hear of these um, attacks. So uh, is there a need to put a pause on that or should that continue and we just try and manage the risk as we go along? That is the question that I will have for you. And now last but not least, um, 13 hours ahead of New York here in Singapore with me, we have Dr. Suprita Vora. Uh, Suprita is Managing Director at Barclays, where she and her team helps corporations, institutional investors, and financial sponsors 
navigate their foreign exchange and interest rate hedging needs. Sir Peter has a PhD in finance and has recently had a paper published in the Journal of International Money and Finance. Sir Peter, I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. If we had gone by surname, it would have been the same order, unfortunately. So thank you for being here and uh, your opening remarks, please. Thank you very much, Lutfi, for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, as uh, previous uh, speakers have mentioned, I'm here in a personal capacity. But I must say the last 45 minutes uh, were power packed with great information. I wish I could carry this group with me to every client meeting, uh, but I've learned a lot across macro themes, uh, inflation, volatility, crypto, cyber, um, not a lot incremental for me to add, but let me try and give a different perspective on this from a risk manager standpoint from how, what we are hearing from our clients. So obviously 2021 has been a year of unexpected macro volatility, uh, both on the positive and on the negative side. And that has been one of the key challenges for risk managers across corporates, financial institutions, as well as uh, funds to navigate. Um, in the best of times, forecasts work only half the time, but in 2021, it has been a spectacular year of forecasts going wrong in every single asset class. Um, you know, as, as Bilal mentioned in, in April of 2020, uh, with uh, oil at minus $37, we couldn't have imagined that it would be at $84 in less than 18 months. Uh, we also spoke about exuberant equity valuations. Um, last year around this time, not many could fathom that we would be pricing in as much as three rate hikes in countries like US and Australia for 2022. It has also been a year of uh, severe emerging market stress. Uh, we have seen Turkish lira weakening by almost 40% this year. And it's not just that currency. Across most EM currencies, um, there has been stress and currencies are down year on year against the dollar. Uh, so FX and rates volatility and how that has shaped the thinking of treasurers and risk managers has been a key focus point uh, this year. And it has had a significant behavioral impact on uh, various approaches with dealing with uh, risks come, going into uh, 2022. Maybe I'll pick two phenomena um, and, and how that has shaped the mindset, and then we can come back to prognosis for next year. So the first one, as I mentioned, sudden volatility, sudden jumps, and, and sudden disruptions in, in currencies and interest rates. What that has done to the mindset is there has been an increased focus in risks that are non-modelable. COVID is a non-modelable risk. You could not see it coming. You could not model it. And there are no standard deviations around the impact of COVID. So this has taken a center stage versus the normal sources of risk, which would result in normal extent of volatility. What the clients are doing as a result is an increased amount of buying of insurance for similar jump events, things which you can't predict and that are, with that are going to come at you from left of field. Um, and what this has resulted is in increased tolerance for a higher hedging budget, for a higher hedging cost uh, appetite. Uh, boards are willing to set aside a pot of money to buy hedge for similar sharp market moves that may materially erode their IRRs. Um, and frankly, what that results in terms of actual hedging strategies is you know, a preference for simple, unbounded risk solutions. Um, and a much, much lower reliance on forecasts. So the hedging strategies are not being driven as much by forecast as they were used to before. The second phenomena uh, is driven by sudden disruptions in real business models that are happening beyond control. So, you know, what we saw with supply chain is a key case in point. Uh, the problems of supply chain may be transitional, may be structural, they may be behind us, but there are other looming risks in front of us. Food inflation is a key case in point. Um, and this uh, is resulted in huge pricing power for those uh, corporate players who can deliver reliability in such times. And as a result, uh, you know, the, the popular acronyms are FOMO and TINA, but right, right behind them is regret risk. And there is a strong desire to reduce regret risk when it comes to business resiliency. Uh, what that has done to mindset, uh, the, the preparation for preparing for design redundancy has become a key focus. Uh, what that means is having excess cash on balance sheet, uh, having backups in the supply chain, 
um, having a much stronger focus on uh, simple things like legal negotiation of project documents and um, M&A documents, such as material adverse clauses. Um, there, there is a stronger focus on measuring what we call the tensile strength of any risk management strategy. At which point is it stretched? And beyond which point does it break? So maybe I'll pause here and, and we can come back to some of these points, Lutpe. Thank you so much, Suprita. I think that's a uh, the perspective of non-financial corporations and their hedging behavior as a result of what's going on in the financial market. That is a wonderful uh, additional dimension that you've brought to this discussion. Uh, my question will be, as you're helping them with their hedging requirements, I've been reading about some structured hedging products that are linked to climate and ESG objectives. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about those when we come round. Um, let me go to uh, Kathy now, please. Kathy, the question, and then I'm sorry, it's a bit over the time, uh, but if, if you could um, help us with that question, please, which is, is there a whole new shadow banking world powered by crypto on blockchain and smart contracts that we need to be afraid of? And if so, what can be done to help mitigate that systemic risk? Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, so um, it is, um, one thing I want to clarify is that there is indeed a new uh, financial ecosystem uh, developing um, alongside the, um, the, um, the existing financial system um, based on blockchain and uh, involving financial derivatives, uh, trading and lending. Um, there are a lot of um, leverages and uh, unlike uh, just pure speculation um, in the early stage of uh, uh, crypto asset development, uh, I want to emphasize that um, there's merit to some of these uh, technology innovation. Um, it's decentralized, uh, no middleman is uh, needed. And so most policymakers are, are, uh, are uh, mindful in the sense of uh, uh, putting too much restriction on, on the uh, DeFi world. At the same time, um, um, they, they do realize um, um, some clarification are needed, um, especially for uh, banking institutions who are involved in, in dealing with this uh, uh, crypto asset. I think you see the effort uh, um, uh, in ar basically around the um, uh, 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 globe in dealing various aspects of uh, uh, crypto assets, um, um, uh, um, the use of crypto assets. Um, you see in the developing countries, um, the concern of uh, capital flow uh, through the crypto assets is a major uh, uh, issue the regulators are concerned about. Um, obviously, uh, for the de developing country, is more financial stability, uh, whether there is um, a spillover. And we all know what happened to a subprime. Um, even though it's a small, it's supposed a greater uh, systemic risk at the time and potentially um, this um, uh, crypto um, uh, uh, asset sector um, could uh, play the same role as um, you know, subprime if it's uh, uh, unregulated. Um, so um, you do see the effort, but I think there should be a, a coordinated effort across uh, uh, policymakers uh, since uh, crypto assets um, do not recognize borders. <laughs> but before you go, Kathy, there's a question in the box. Maybe if I could put that to you. And uh, Deborah Dean from Victoria University Wellington is asking, um, do smart contracts uh, and developments on, on those lines pose particular and new legal risks? I think definitely, um, for example, um, um, 
there are various uh, legal uh, <laughs> uh, issues raised um, uh, in various um, uh, 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 new form of digital assets. But, um, for some emerging uh, market countries, um, the issuance of for uh, um, central bank digital currency pose a new uh, legal risk because um, it um, may not be um, in um, in the legal uh, CBDC may not be a legal tender un unless there's a certain um, um, legal change uh, have to be made. So you can see um, there's a whole host of legal issues associated with a uh, crypto asset. Um, this is just on the CBDC front, and there are also various other uh, derivative contract and, and, and how decentralized derivative contract, how they are different from uh, centralized derivative contract. So it's a whole new uh, world out there. So. Okay, thank you so much, Kathy. <laughs> Very good to, to have you with us um, here today. Uh, Bilal, let me come back to you with the question that, um, that I wanted to ask you, which is, is there ever going to be an exit to um, easing or is that here to stay? No, that's a good question. And I think it's going to be very hard for central banks to completely unwind what they've uh, engaged in. I mean, we saw the Fed try to do it, you know, during, um, you know, we, we had the Fed uh, taper tantrum 2013, they started a hike 2015, 2016. And then, you know, obviously, we had COVID in, intervening, but now we we have a more extreme set of monetary policy than we when than we've uh, ever seen. And the ECB, for example, wasn't really able to exit. So my bias is to say that I think it will be difficult for them to exit. But the other way of looking at this is to try to understand what is the consequence of the monetary policy easing that they've had. And I think my sense is that a large amount of the monetary easing that's happened has really uh, gone into the financial system rather than into the real economy. So I think it's done a lot to inflate asset markets in general. And I think the inflation we're seeing around the world today, I think is less to do with central banks. I think it's more to do with supply chain interruptions, COVID, pandemic, and fiscal measures where central bank, where um, treasuries, or the US Treasury essentially gave checks to, to households. Um, I think the, the issue with monetary policy at the moment, um, and the way it's been structured is that it's not really structured to make it easy for the average guy on the street to get money in their hand. It's really structured to support banks and the financial system. So if there is going to be some reverse of the easing hikes, then I think asset markets will really start to come under pressure, equity markets, housing markets. And I think for that reason, um, I think sort of power structures of our society are such that they won't really be very comfortable with a big destruction of wealth in, in that way. So I think it will be very hard, you know, for, uh, you know, for central banks to, to unwind their easings in, in a meaningful way. We may get a few hikes, but I think it will be hard for uh, policy rates to even go back to where they were at their peak before the COVID uh, pandemic. Thank you, Bilal. And uh, by the way, at this stage of the discussion, you're all welcome to jump in on any of the topics that we're discussing. Um, Dick said, if I could come to you, uh, please. So I really want to hear the story of the Deutsche Bank credit upgrade, because I remember the time when not too long ago, when you guys were having some trouble with the cocoa investors and, and so on. Um, so what's the lesson here for all of us? So, you know, uh, did I hear JP say the bank was, you know, LSE meaning long-term, sustainable and exciting? <laughs> that's what I would have said, you know, we've now done with Deutsche Bank. Um, so, Lutfino, you're right in pointing out, you know, sort of the AT1 structure of hybrid capital is now a feature of the bank landscape, which allows, you know, which allows regulatory authorities a means of ensuring that you're able to bail in banks in a, in a, and resolve banks in a standardized manner and in a way that doesn't then, you know, create systemic risk. Um, you know, we've had now three uh, upgrades from all of the three main agencies, Moody's, Fitch, and S&P most recently uh, to A- minus on the counterparty rating, which, you know, most, most welcome. Uh, in the case of Moody's, for example, that was the first upgrade after 14 years. You know, all three, I think, are reflective of the transformation the firm's undergone, the significant changes that we've made to the balance sheet, to steer towards more stable sources of liquidity, but also the business mix shifting towards more stable sources of revenue. 
And all of that's then underpinned, you know, tighter spreads, um, you know, more confidence with fixed income investors, again, ratification from the ratings agencies, which has been quite good. Um, but on the 81 front, you know, we just did a, a billion and a quarter euro transaction recently uh, at a four and a half percent coupon, which is an all time low for an 81 coupon from from us. And again, I think it's reflective of all of these uh, these uh, issues. Thank you. I'm, I'm holding here with me at the uh, an issue of the IFR from September 2016. And the headline is another fine mess. Deutsche Bank's capital worries return. And so it's, it's a big change uh, from there. Uh, tremendous uh, story. Um, uh, Hugh, could I come to you with uh, my follow-up question, please, uh, which was about stranded assets and uh, stages of stranded assets making themselves felt, exposed, and does that create a domino effect amongst banks and systemic risk? Uh, well, look, I think this is a uh, quite rightly a sort of a, a complex question. And so let's let's start with the current sort of rules of thumb that financial investors are using is, is um, looking at the left hand tail, you know, the biggest polluters, and then bit by bit under whether it be from economic pressure, regulatory pressure, investor pressure, starting to trim or chop them off. And so for instance, very few banks are funding now new coal mines. Uh, very few banks are funding um, exploration in uh, tar sands in Canada and so forth. So it's about slicing off the, the, the worst of the tail, which for a risk panel fits right. You know, it's just chopping off the tail. But at the moment, it's been a very small part of that tail. Um, and so the question really, the broader question is then, to what extent will we get a much broader range of stranded assets in the coming 10 years or so? And what might that be? Now, I think there's a couple of interesting points here. So first, as probably you know, everyone on, on the listening today will know, the duration of a bank's balance sheet is not that long. You know, it's, it, for, for a corporate loan, it's probably in the order of three, max four years. Um, and actually the Basel reforms actually shorten the duration in many ways of the bank's lending. So um, you know, on the optimistic side, the bank should be able to quote, you know, to recycle their portfolio to a limit to reduce that risk and so what was interesting for instance with the the french did a um uh, uh, gave us a sort of sneak peek of some of the stress tests they had an exercise earlier in the year where they suggested that you know maybe loan losses could treble by 2050 for the banks but this was only on about 10 percent of their portfolio so that means that the overall impact in loan losses were really de minimis compared to the pandemic um, and in fact actually insurers and investors are far more impacted because they've got the long, longer dated assets on their balance sheets or sorry, in, their, in their portfolios, I'm sorry. So um, actually for the banks, it could be manageable, but where could it, but this is a risk panel, so where could it get complicated? So one would be um, very swift changes in regulation, which then change uh, things, in particular um, uh, relating to you know, the duration of life or you know, we're now, if governments say, well, I'm going to exit coal by such and such a date, or what would they do? Uh, but I think as Bilal suggested, you know, I think there's going to be a real trade-off here of how, much, how high an, or, uh, an energy price politicians are prepared to run with, but you know, it doesn't mean they won't make mistakes. Um, I think second would be the interconnectivity between insurance and banking risk. So because a bank may say, look, I'm prepared to underwrite this loan Bit or uh, because I fit that I know it's got insurance, what happens if the insurer pulls the plug? And obviously there's a notable case in Australia this year financing a coal mine where some of the construction firms lost insurance and therefore there were lost access to capital for that particular project. So I think that interconnectivity is an issue there. And third, we need to just run scenarios about how quickly um, you know, some of these stranded assets may appear. Uh, I mean, I suspect that one of the risks we really need to think about hard is the risk is these stranded assets take longer to appear because of the 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 the, rea the, the reality of the uh, uh, you know the climate realities of of, 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 of financing. Uh, but you know it's it's complicated, and um, I think we need to be quite. I think um, bottom line is we need to follow closely government policies and the politics of this as much as the economics. I, I hear you on that point about uh, the risk of these assets appearing not quickly enough. I was um, at, a, at an event hosted by one of the major banks a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so we had investors there saying that we're ready with the money to 
to put into climate finance and to green finance. But we're concerned that if standards don't appear quickly enough, regulations don't appear quickly enough, anything we invest into today in good faith may turn out to have been a greenwashing product with hindsight. And so it, it becomes a future stranded asset because the definitions get tighter. So the sooner we get clarity on that, the lower the risk of that happening. I, I, th I think that's right, but you know, um, you know, we all have to invest with uncertainty. Uh, there's always been regulatory change, and I think also, bottom line, I think one thing which I think we all on the panel realise is um, most of the solutions require innovation. And you know, um, you know, if I think about the first wave of uh, renewable investment, uh, the VCs lost about half their money. You know, fifty cents in the dollar because those particular renewables didn't pay off. I mean, I think there is this is a sector which is inherent in innovation and change. And therefore, there's going to be big winners and losers out of this. So I, 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 I think it's going to be difficult for the governments to, sorry, this may be a case where we shouldn't overestimate good regulation. We should go long innovation. Right. Makes sense. So, uh, sorry, Dixit. Yeah, uh, just on that, on that last point around embracing innovation and perhaps, you know, some comments on what Kathy was saying, there's no doubt in call it, you know, web 3.0 within DeFi, that there's some amazing technology, which is going to be transformative and will actually change many of the rails that the payment system collateral operates on and really the workings of the financial system. But I think what that doesn't take away from is going to be the need for well-regulated institutions undertaking businesses which can bring together services, including provision of a balance sheet and bringing capital to bear, whether it's the lending businesses that were spoken about, and doing that in a manner that's regulatory friendly, which I think will attract more volume. And that's typically been the case over the last, you know, a couple of decades in finance, whenever you've had good regulation, centralized venues, you've had an explosion of volumes. And I think you're going to see a lot of that happen. So, you know, there might be a fringe, um, you know, where products and transactions take place, which, you know, may be speculative, you know, but they won't be driving and might not have the right documentation and so on. But I don't think that will be driving the main infrastructure that we operated on. So I'm actually quite excited about the transformative power this technology has on the financial system and making banking more, more interesting, making banking exciting, but more importantly, being able to reduce a significant amount of cost and being able to create more throughput uh, in the banking system. Makes sense, makes sense. So let's now go to the Chief Risk Officer of Leverage Supervised Entity, LSC, uh, uh, to hear about his prognosis for the coming year. Thank you. Uh, it's not a prognosis, and the President of the Risk Committee is not supposed to prognose, but just be ready and plan ahead. So one of the worries I would have in the regulatory space is I don't believe that the exorbitant privilege uh, has diminished. People talk about it that way. I think the crisis in 2020 has shown us that, if anything, the dollar and the Fed are more powerful than ever. I think we are in a stronger hege hegemony of the dollar. And so as a bank in the UK or in Europe, uh, I have to uh, you know, be prepared that my balance sheet will be whacked more by US and by Fed policies than, than before. And that may be a, a risk for me. The second one is moral hazard. So that's, that's a big one because we have seen how powerful the central bank uh, regulations and rules and loosening of macro potential and FX swap lines and all of these things were really, really helpful in reducing the fear. They reduced the long-term tails of the distributions that you can look at through the options markets that reveal what the market thinks about the future. And these policies really did bring in the left tails, not only for the next six months or one year or two years, but even 10 and 20 years. So there is a perception now. The second time this happened after the great financial crisis, the Fed came in very, very quickly, knew what to do, had the tools ready from the previous one, made many of them you know, more permanent than before. And the market knows that. The market knows if there's another COVID or whatever it's going to be, the Fed will go big, even bigger than before, will have these standing facilities. And that must be caked in into what the future will hold. People will take more risks. Uh, if they hesitated borrowing in dollars before, now they won't because they know these, uh, these facilities will be there. And we have to, we have to 
be aware of that tail that people think there is may actually not be the, the correct tail because of the moral hazard. So one has to not rely overly on what the market thinks in the future. Then we had inflation. So you all talked about sort of maybe the end of the magic money, as Sebastian Mellaby would say. And I just want to add a little thing on that. There's if rates are going to go up, I asked my chief risk officer of bank LSE to calculate that. And we are a very conservative bank and we, are, we use swaps to macro hedge all the stuff. But if interest rates go up by 2%, there will be blood on the streets. I mean, our bank LSE will lose 5%, but we are really macro hedged. Lots of banks are not macro hedged by the, by the ALM department in the same way. And there will be lots of banks very close to the regulatory capital ratios if only interest rates go up by 2%. Of course, maybe I mean, 2% looks like you know impossibly big number uh, today because we think of basis points, but that is something we have to be um, careful. So, uh, the other regulatory problems I see is I am not a fan of central bank digital currencies. I don't really understand, you know, I'm sure they are, they are they're fantastic for lots of people. But for me, as the president of the risk committee of the bank, this is not a good idea. Because if there is going to be a little bit of a crisis, then the depositors will take the money out of my bank, LAC, and I'm really, you know, carefully managing that bank and so forth. But no matter, they will take the money out, bring it to the central bank, and there will be, uh, there will be be a flight from all the commercial banks, howsoever good and brilliant they are, uh, to the central bank. I don't like that idea. I don't like the idea that the central bank will have a government guarantee and compete for deposits with me. I don't like that. I don't like to be governed by the central bank or the FCA, whatever it may be, uh, that also has their own uh, you know, CBDCs and compete with me. That doesn't sound right. So there are lots of things about CBDCs that I as a banker object to. Maybe they are good for society, but they are not good uh, for, uh, for me, actually. And, uh, and maybe the last thing I want to say is too big to fail. Uh, in one of the concerns I have in Europe is there is a push for bank consolidation. Uh, that may be the right thing to do in some countries, but the, the way it is sold is that Europe in general needs fewer banks. I don't, as I don't know, being the risk committee of bank LSE, which is local sort of mid-sized bank, I cannot uh, believe that a big bank would know my clients as well as I do. And it must be a function of the clients and the country and the regular regime and the economy, uh, whether a country has lots of small banks or just one mega bank. So I don't like that push in Europe towards one or two or three big banks. That's me. Uh, so otherwise you're quite happy, it seems. <laughs> I have a whale of a time. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I will ask the others to, to comment on some of uh, what JP had to say um, on the moral hazard point, on the undesirability of um, the referees coming down to play, if you like, the central banks turning into players, uh, or something he said earlier about leverage ratios and causing perhaps unintended behaviours where banks don't want your money anymore because of the balance sheet cost. Um, so if we have time, we'll, we'll ask you to jump in on that, please. Um, Neil, I'm, um, uh, I'm curious, do you think banks are going too fast? Um, no, uh, but what's the alternative to, I mean, <clears throat> it's, it's very important to understand that uh, as an operational risk, cyber risk will always have an extraordinarily high uh, residual risk. And partially that's because the inherent risk is extremely high. This is not, uh, you know, it, I, I was struck by, um, I can't remember who said it, maybe Sprita mentioned that uh, the pandemic was an unmonable risk in many, many ways. So as a cyber risk, because we're talking about criminals, we're talking about human beings who exploit technology vulnerabilities and sometimes human vulnerabilities to perpetrate uh, very highly scalable crime. Um, so that is a residual, that's an inherent and residual risk <clears throat> that will continue to be high. And if you want to re reduce that residual risk to zero, uh, then you need to disconnect from the internet, which I don't think is a viable option for any serious uh, uh, institution, let alone um, a mid-sized regional and certainly not a, a GSIP. 
uh, financial institution. Um, so um, I don't think the alternative is viable just from a, from a practical business perspective, first of all. Uh, second of all, um, you can get, it's difficult to get in front of the threat because the threat changes more rapidly than technology changes. And as you know, technology changes very rapidly, but that's also a good thing in that um, you have more and more technology companies that are baking security into the forefront of the side of their technologies. Uh, you have um, you have the major IT vendors and the cloud providers that offer a suite of security tools that come with the services if you know how to use them. So that really puts it back on what is the institution doing? Um, and um, I, I'm biased because of where I come from, but I think a lot of people would agree that the financial services industry uh, have, has some of the most sophisticated cybersecurity uh, programs uh, among industries. And there are many reasons for that. Uh, one is because they spend an enormous amount of money. I'll, I'll leave it to uh, the participants and the viewers to do the Google searches about how much any given GSIB spends on cybersecurity, but it's hundreds of millions of dollars. That, that's, that's pretty much what most of them spend. Um, and also because that's the regulatory expectation. This is a very highly supervised field and the regulators are very sophisticated uh, across, across the uh, world not just in uh, you know, the usual alphabet soup, uh, but in just about every uh, uh, sophisticated reg regulated uh, financial services market that I've ever been in, um, the regulators know what to expect. They know what, what best practices are. They know what the standards are. And, and they strongly uh, expect uh, their supervised entities to adhere to that. Um, so you have that, but also what do you have in a program? Um, as I said, the inherent risk is high because we're talking about criminals. And a sophisticated cybersecurity program has a very strong and very active threat intelligence and threat modeling component to it. Their job is to understand how is the threat different today than it was yesterday? How is the bad guy going to try to attack us or anybody in our ecosystem, third party, fourth party aggregate risk? What will that attack look like and what controls do we need to meet that threat model? That is a, that's a core component of a sophisticated cybersecurity program, which most uh, uh, many financial, uh, many banks have. Um, so that helps you uh, at least try to keep pace. And, and there's a very strong information sharing ecosystem. The, the uh, banks um, uh, are, are members of financial services, information sharing and analysis council, for example, FSI SAC. Uh, there's an FSI SAC in the United States. There's an FSI SAC in Switzerland. That, that's nascent. They're just standing that up. There are many information sharing entities that are joined by both government uh, and uh, industry participants. I, I joined them when I was CISO at, at UBS. I also talked to all of the other CISOs. We talked to each other. What are you seeing in the threat? How is it changing? Um, one thing you might notice is that when you look at the heads of the security departments in many banks worldwide, many of them are former government uh, because they learned how to be intelligent. They learned how to treat a technology threat and the human behind it, right? So these are areas that I think uh, allow a firm to keep pace with, with the market expectations of digital transformation, which I think is absolutely critical. And then I also mentioned how are they transforming in, in digitization? How is the digital transformation happening? And who are your partners in that in, in the technology world? And how are they bringing technology uh, to the table with you? That is where you have a massive opportunity. Cloud is a perfect example. So cloud is, is part of the strategy of many firms digital transformation. Um, I personally think cloud can be much more safer uh, for a number of reasons. Um, some are very technical, like you know, if you have a vulnerability, well, if it's in the cloud, you have a partner that can patch that vulnerability much more quickly. But also, am I comfortable with my budget or am I comfortable with my budget plus my major global cloud providers budget when it comes to security? I like the more resources. I like having a very strong partner rather than just doing it ourselves. Um, so there are many opportunities if you manage it right uh, and you, you do what, what many uh, banks are doing. I think you can I think you can. Um, I think you can be a partner for digital transfer, transformation. And as the cybersecurity expert, whether you're a CISA or whatever, your main job is to preserve and extend the value of those digitization efforts. And I think that's how you do it. It's very forcefully and passionately argued. So I won't uh, argue against that. And I think uh, the question of whether cloud um, or the, the adoption of cloud by more and more banks is going to add or subtract from systemic risk is one of the agenda topics at the Systemic Risk Center that they're working on right now. So Peter, um, 
Tell us a bit about innovation in finance, please. Sure. Um, and maybe I can just, uh, before we jump to the very exciting part of ESG, just pick up from what Neil said and had a couple of side comments on that from a derivative standpoint. And, and you know, most of you would agree derivatives uh, within the financial sector is one of the most regulated uh, subsets. Um, and there's a lot of uh, digitization uh, efforts that are going on in that space, uh, led by, and you know, Dixit would know this better than me because it sits on the board of ISDA, but it's, it's a great initiative that is being led by ISDA uh, to bring various parts of what constitutes a derivative life cycle, life cycle uh, into blockchain and make it uh, usable uh, and machine readable and machine executable. And what is, what is a, painfully manual process today, um, starting with onboarding a client to ISDA negotiation, to dealing and executing and booking and then margining and then collateralizing and then reporting to a regulator. It's, I cannot wait for a day when all of that is on the machine and, and uh, you know, I lose my job. Uh, but, but basically, I think they're, the challenges that Neil pointed out are very real. Because as soon as you put that on a, a system which is readable by multiple systems, uh, by multiple financial institutions and clients across the street, you have to immediately address uh, how do you put the right gates uh, on information sharing. And there is a lot of sensitive information that's sloshing around in a $15 trillion market. Um, so, you know, at, if we get time, I would love to hear Dixit's uh, view on it, sitting at the top of the pile at, at ISTA board. Um, on the ESG side, uh, that's a rapidly uh, innovative uh, market segment as well. Um, we heard a lot about how that market is changing from a perspective of uh, many corporates moving towards uh, setting up milestones, whether it be uh, net zero or specific ESG KPIs. Um, when it comes to financing and capital markets and derivative transactions, there are two or three ways of uh, structuring uh, products around that. Uh, the first one is, of course, to incentivize uh, users of such capital instruments by uh, designating a capital product as an ESG-friendly product through the use of proceeds. So if you're using a money, if you're raising money from capital markets or from the street and using it towards a green project, then by definition, that's a green financing. Um, by extension, a derivative on top of that is a green derivative. Uh, the second way is if you are financing a project using a sustainable uh, financing, which means that the financing itself is getting an economic benefit uh, by uh, linking the cost of borrowing to specific uh, KPIs that are determined by the corporate board. Um, and the third one is specific KPI linked uh, derivatives, which may or may not be sitting on top of a green financing or a green project. Um, so and my all cost of borrowing can go up or down depending that's right. on my performance. Whether you have achieved the KPIs or not. And, and again, referring to ISDA, they published a, a document earlier this year, um, kind of doing like a rolodexing of the kind of ESG derivatives that have been done in the market globally. And it's it makes for very interesting reading because there is a wide range of sectors which have participated in that. So you've had wind power, you've had logistics, you've had real estate. Uh, and you've got food and agri players uh, participating in ESG derivatives. Um, and across all these uh, instruments, including interest rates, uh, FX, uh, cross-currency swaps, and so on. Uh, the challenges are really, to summarize, uh, you know, making sure that the measurement of KPIs are, doing, are being done in an unbiased manner by a third-party auditing firm. Um, and frankly, the KPIs are being set at a level which is rigorous and stretched. It should not be something that you're any way able to achieve uh, in a BAU manner. But I do think that this is going to proliferate very quickly into a very large uh, part of the derivative market, Lutfi. Rapid changes on that front. Thank you very much. Um, just a minute or two left. Does anyone want to comment on anything so far? Perhaps, Lutfi, just a quick comment on Supriya's points around uh, ISDA. You know, the, the only way to get interoperability is first to start with having a common taxonomy. And so that's what ISDA has been spending time on is through the common domain model is create a language or taxonomy that we're all speaking to. Then you're able to apply any technology. It happens to be that we have some really good technology, you know, with permission, private blockchains, et cetera, that one can apply. But at least we're, we're mapping to the same type of transaction across the universe. 
And then if I said to you, you know, using the new tools that we have, you know, you're able to margin the contract automatically between ourselves and you because we have a contract, you know, that defines what the margining is. We're able to settle that automatically without needing a human being in the settlement chain. And I give you all the controls that you have today. You'd say, I'm happy to do that. And I think that's what this new technology allows you to do. It will take some time to get implemented. And note, I haven't used the word decentralized in any way, which, you know, to a regulator can be quite a scary word. Many of these solutions don't actually need to be completely decentralized. And so, you know, I think you're going to see a lot of evolution um, in, in the space, as Supriya was saying. So there are two, just two questions left in the Q&A box. One from Owen Go asking JP, when you mentioned the standing facilities about domestic repos and foreign market repos, um, and you call it a watershed moment. Why has it received so little attention? I don't know if you have a very quick answer to that. I think basically because they're not needed at the moment. Nobody wants to have extra cash. Everybody has excess cash. But once things change and the next crisis hits and we would like to get rid of even liquid bonds and have cash again, then I, I expect these to be used uh, more widely. So I, I think slowly over time, uh, they will be accepted. And for me, they just signal that the Fed actually now takes on the mantle of world central bank to an extent it hasn't it has been ambivalent before, yeah. but only time will tell. I can't be completely wrong, of course, and they can take them away again. We, we don't know. So for now, reinforced moral hazard provider of the last resort. Um, and then I think the other question is for Hugh. Um, what about stranded assets in other industries like automotive airlines? Could they contribute to systemic risk? Uh, look, it's a great question. I mean, I, I do think, I mean, this this is a whole economy transformation. And so clearly, whether it, it, in, the, in the, the five big sectors, which currently um, generate most emissions, um, all of those, whether it's transportation, um, you know, obviously commodities, energy utilities, I think it's across the piece that, can, that there's a possibility. Um, whether it's systemic, I guess, comes down to, you know, partly political decisions, partly economic decisions. I mean, you know, it is fascinating. Here we are with uh, the, the switch to EVs being as fast as it has been. And in some ways, let's be honest, it's more down to Elon than it is down to regulators. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very struck that something like over 80% of US car manufacturers, R&D and CapEx is on EVs today, whereas the, at the beginning of the year, it's still only in the low 50s for European firms. So getting, but you know, um, I think it comes down to two things. One is the, the regulatory side. The second is uh, the pace of firms to reinvent. You know, as we all know with this innovators dilemma, people want, you know, some large firms seize the opportunity, but most of them sort of sit back and watch it develop. And so the pace of change and then the response and how quickly existing firms reinvent themselves is, is really the, the key question we should all debate. Thank you very much. And that question was from Jan Lemon from um, the Erasmus University of Rotterdam. If I, if I may say, Ludwig, Jan was an FMG uh, uh, student uh, or, and researcher at the time, so I'm very happy to, uh, to see him on this, on this panel. Great. And with that, we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank the panel uh, once again for uh, for being here, particularly uh, Neil and Saprita. Uh, this is a uh, not ordinary hour, so really grateful for that and thankful to all of you for being here. We had an amazing conversation and uh, all the best until next time. Take care.